say, though, to, to people who, who accuse you and any ideas that you bring forward of just allowing the, uh, the white liberal masses to be comfortable with their own prejudices? Saying, well, I and Hersey at least says this, so, so we, don't have, we no longer have to be tolerant in some ways. It, it makes them more comfortable with their prejudice because you're saying it. Yeah, but what I see, the white liberal masses are comfortable right now with being very complacent and being very multiculturalist and ignoring all these things and just thinking that that's all their culture. And I think what I do actually makes white liberals very, very uncomfortable because it puts under your nose you are looking away from victims of these various malpractices in your country. And this is a liberal society. So I make white liberals uncomfortable by showing them that they are looking away from practices that they shouldn't be looking away from. The women that you're talking about are saying, don't worry. We are all taking, you know, it's all within the Islamic or Muslim community. It means peace. There is a misunderstanding that religion means peace. Please don't worry. So they actually are making the white liberals giving them that exit or easy exit option not have to have to worry about the practices that I just mentioned, honor killings, female gentleman fish, all these practices. And I, I, this is only, this is in regards to women. I'm not even talking about what happens to homosexuals, Muslim homosexuals. I think the most vulnerable group that you can find. Uh, those groups and the way that they are treated or mistreated by society, um, I think it is, it's white liberals who would like to have an exit option. Now, I'm not getting it from me. And in fact, if you look at the commentary that white liberals fight on my work, it's always that I'm strident and uh, radical and confrontational and um, I'm not using the right tactics, not using... You know, with both those uh, Muslims who say that they care about human rights, but that my attitude is too striking for them and the liberals. It's all a no, 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 no. What do they propose? What are they doing to make a change? Where are the results? Okay, let me let me put that question to you then, in terms of seeing the results and the solutions. What do you see? How would you describe them then? Because it, you know, rather than just being the provocateur, the person who highlights the problems, mm -hmm. what are the solutions? Um, well, I didn't just provoke. When in the Netherlands, the Liberal Party gave me a chance to actually do something, mm. that it wasn't only that all of the people now became aware of what was going on on Dutch soil, but there were policy measures that were taken. Money was put into finding out are there other kids, how many of them, what do we do about them. There were education projects set up, perpetrators were chased. Things had changed. If you, as a Muslim woman in 2002, went to the police and said, I'm afraid my father is going to kill me, you know, they laughed at you as if you were some crazy teenager. T crazy teenagers say that all the time. Today it's different. If you are a Muslim woman going to a police station and saying, my father might want to kill me, the policeman will tell you, come on, he'll know where the shelter is, he'll know uh, the, shelter, the shelter to send her to. He will have a group of people that will go to the father and explain to him that this is not how it works. There is a migrant immigrant organization that comes and needs. There is an infrastructure in place that wasn't there in place. These are concrete steps that have been taken. In the United States, I've set up the AHA Foundation with a number of American women who are willing to raise money and awareness. And our intention is not only to talk about it, but to get the necessary legislation to make domestic violence organizations know about the fact that this is a particular type of domestic organization. We want to work together with Canadians. So it's not just all provoke and what do you call it, take a poker and uh, poke it in someone's eyes. No, it's great you know, to think through what are, uh, what are these things. I heard to you the chapter of money because lots of Muslim women when they do decide to take a step uh, and choose for their own emancipation, then they find themselves confronted with other, for them, brand new problems, like dealing with money, like language classes, like who do you trust, um, aggression, traumas, etc. So all of these things are things that sexuality, as a woman, 
God, you are a Muslim family, all your authority is be ashamed, you must have made a religion, etc. So when you come out of that culture and you come into the openness, it is very important that others, non-Muslims, know that some of these young girls also need proper sex education. Um, we can open uh, the questions in just a, just a moment or two. I have a couple more questions for you, Ayan. Um, you mentioned in, in your earlier comments Theo Bingo. Obviously, this is a huge turning point for you, and you talk about him in, in uh, your book. Um, Theo Bingo, the man that you made your film submission with, ended up dead. Um, what kind of an impact did his death have on you? Uh, well, it's huge. His murder. It's huge, huge. Um, it is, uh, I still feel the effects. I, I still have, first of all, I have to live with the fact that the other one is dead. The past few years, I was in complete denial. I couldn't believe that it had happened and that it had happened the way it happened. And I couldn't believe that the Dutch government responded to it in the way that they did. Our head of state, our prime minister, went to the Moroccan community. You know, that kind of outrageous um, so-called compensation or accommodation or whatever. I mean, it, it, I felt that if you look at uh, the negligence of the Secret Service having had hints that he was a target, uh, not dealing with it, not acting uh, fast enough to prevent the matter, uh, that fills me with anger. Uh, when he was killed, the way his parents were treated and his family, that still is a very, 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 um, you know, disturbing. I had, I had a full of regrets because I think, oh, I should have dissuaded him much harder than I did not to put his name on, uh, on the cover. But his question was, what do you think is going to happen? Uh, or should I have said, you know, you're going to be shot? Ten times and stabbed ten times, and you'll be beheaded. I didn't know that. I only knew I had a vague idea that something terrible might happen. I was in under protection from October 2002 until that time, and my protection was getting ever more serious. But when I asked the Dutch Secret Service what are you protecting me against, um, they couldn't tell me exactly what it was because they obviously have to keep that spoiled at the Secret Service. But is it, we follow this attempt on your life, and we follow that attempt on your life. But what exactly was the attempt? They couldn't tell me. They, got, they didn't want to tell me. So it was very theoretic. It was very imagined what is going to happen. And when it happened, I just thought, oh my goodness, um, poor Theo, this should never, ever, ever have happened. And I was planning to make some mission part two. I was planning to do all sorts of other things. And I think now, um, collaboration with other people will have to be on my side, which is for the other side, complete anonymity and you have less contact with this with his family? I did in the beginning, uh, but now I think it's just on the anniversary itself. 